crisis, we felt that it was uh, important that we hear not just about theory, but theory put into practice. And it's hard to imagine a, uh, a better example of a practitioner than Stan Fisher. Uh, Stan, as you know, is the governor of the Bank of Israel uh, and had a lot of practice dealing with uh, the most recent financial crisis. But, but uh, that's not all. Uh, in a previous incarnation, uh, he was at the IMF, he was the deputy managing director, he dealt with the Asian financial crisis in, in, the, in the 1990s. Uh, and before that, and, and this is important too, he was a distinguished academic economist at MIT, so he really knows uh, about both theory and the practical side. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to his remarks uh, this evening without further ado. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Eric, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I have to apologize. There are a few people in the audience who've heard this uh, speech before, uh, and uh, I don't know whether I should change my views to make it interesting, or, uh, but I more or less stick to, uh, to the same, uh, the same uh, set of views. What I want to do is to present a, a series of, of lessons uh, from the global uh, crisis, some of them new, uh, some of them old, uh, about things we've uh, learned or things we've had reinforced uh, by, uh, by, this, uh, by this crisis. And uh, I called it... Uh, crisis lessons and questions, because they're questions uh, that still need to be answered, some of them theoretical, some of them require a lot of empirical work, uh, and uh, I'll put them on the board as well, uh, just to uh, make sure that we don't think that any of this is, uh, is particularly settled. Um, the first issue is uh, that which I think you all learned as undergraduates if you've done economics, and that is the issue of uh, the liquidity trap. Uh, the statement which you will read in the textbooks that uh, once the central bank interest rate, or actually it just says once the interest rate gets to zero, uh, that's the end of monetary policy. Then you have to turn to fiscal policy. Well, it turns out that that's not as straightforward as it sounds just on the monetary policy side because uh, the interest rate that, that the central bankers set is the uh, short term, the shortest term. In some countries, it's a three-month. In most countries, it's a, an overnight rate. It's a very short-term uh, interest rate. Now, you can't uh, go below that, although there are various schemes for going, bo going below that. Uh, those of you who uh, know who Keynes is and who even uh, more than that have read uh, the, 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 uh, the appendices in the general theory will know that there was an Argentinian called uh, Giselle, oh, I don't know how you say it, who had the plan of stamping money so that it had a date on it and you had to bring it in each year and each stamp it got it went down in value so, you're, so it was paying negative interest and uh, if you have negative interest on the currency then you can have negative interest on the, uh, on the government bonds but anyway nobody's put that into practice uh, yet uh, uh, and so uh, the, the lower bound on the central bank interest rate is uh, zero. But what we uh, had driven home in this crisis is that once you get to zero, it's not the end of the story. Um, the ones who've 
come closest to uh, this point are the uh, Japanese and the, and the Americans. The Fed fixed its interest rate, uh, or said, the Fed's declared interest rate now still is, quote, between zero and 25 basis points. That is, there's no unique number. Uh, and the reason there's no unique number is that uh, the question is, what are you fixing? Are you fixing quantities or are you fixing uh, the interest rate? And say so we, the Japanese, fix 10 basis points, but then they just supply the amount of liquidity that you need to hit uh, 10 uh, basis points. What the Fed did was to decide to increase its holdings of particular assets by particular amounts. And uh, as a result of it saying we're going to increase our holdings of assets by a nominal amount, they left the interest rate uh, undetermined, but they expect it to be between zero and 25 basis points, essentially zero. And quantitative easing just means injecting more liquidity into the system, uh, which is what they do by buying uh, assets. Now, the central bank then uh, um, faces the issue of how much, how much should it buy? Uh, well, you can say infinity if you want, but uh, they're not going to do that because presumably if you put a lot of liquidity into the system, you've got to take it out at some point, or you're likely to have to take it out, and you don't want to overdo things. The method was proposed for how to calculate how much uh, to put in was there is a, a Taylor rule uh, which is, tells you, um, it's John Taylor's uh, rule, which tells you uh, what interest rate uh, to fix as a function of uh, the expected uh, rate of inflation. and. Uh, in the economy and the uh, level of activity, and you can uh, calculate what the interest rate should be according to the Taylor rule. Well, the calculations of what the interest rate should be according to the Taylor rule, as they were done first by somebody at Goldman Sachs, was minus 8%. Um, then the question was, uh, how much money, how much liquidity do you have to put in to get to minus 8%. Uh, and uh, he proposed a simple rule, just assume that the relationship between the interest rate and the quantity of monetary base is what it was as measured in the good old days when the interest rate didn't have to be negative, and extrapolate. And that's how much you have to put in. And it was a lot. Then others did the calculation. They came up with minus 5% as the interest rate that it should be. But in any way, you, in that way, you get some indication as to how much uh, you need to uh, put in in order to achieve whatever the target is uh, of monetary policy uh, at, uh, at the time. Uh, there are other ways, but I won't go, uh, go into them. Um, there was a second way the Fed intervened, which central banks may have done in the past, but never really, uh, never really uh, described fully. And that's uh, what the Fed, the Fed tried to call it credit easing. Uh, that was the name they gave, to, they gave to it. It didn't stick at all. Uh, but what they tried to do was to go in and fix markets which were not operating. For instance, in the United States, the commercial paper market just dried up. No transactions. Nobody willing to buy commercial paper. Similarly, the uh, market for, uh, uh, for mortgage-based instruments, uh, the notorious instruments that created, uh, that are held responsible for some, by some for help, helping uh, create this crisis. Um, in the case of commercial paper, the Fed just went in and bought, in, bought enough commercial paper so the transaction started and it eventually got the, the market back to operation. 
and the commercial paper market began to revive because there was a buyer who was willing to buy. And it did the same in the mortgage market, uh, in the uh, asset-backed, mortgage-backed market uh, for, uh, for paper. Now, that's not quite the same. The aim wasn't just to expand liquidity in the economy. It was to expand liquidity in the economy in the markets, which had stopped functioning as a result of the panic. And uh, this uh, they tried to call credit easing. Everybody continued calling it quantitative easing, even though it isn't quite the same thing. It is a job which is almost akin to lender of last resort, but it's not quite, and so it's got the name market maker of last resort. So I wrote this uh, paper which described these things and called, uh, referred, and this could be called the market maker of last resort, I said. Uh, and I quoted somebody who said it. So I got an angry letter from a fairly well-known economist, which is, I used that phrase first. So, okay, so in the next version, I attributed it to this guy, who I won't name, but you all know him, uh, and uh, said, as the phrase, as introduced to the literature by X. Then I got a letter from another one who said, 20 years earlier, look in this paper from 1973, I used the phrase market maker of last resort, at which place point I decided I was giving up on the history of economic thought. And I just said, as sometimes called, uh, the market maker of, uh, of last resort. That's what the Fed has done. It was successful in that. It did revive these markets. And that meant it did find a way of getting financing to firms who were being cut off uh, from financing because of uh, panic. The, uh, the fact that the Fed intervened, later there was credit, uh, there was quantitative easing too, when they decided to buy um, longer term assets. And uh, that people took that as some absolutely outrageous event, which I couldn't quite understand. I mean, the Prime Minister, the for Finance Minister of Brazil, I don't remember what words he used, but he used really incendiary words about how the United States was trying to, uh, oh, it was a currency wars word, but it was stronger than that, was trying basically uh, to uh, destroy the world economy uh, all for its own good by, uh, by uh, going into the longer term markets. Actually, the fact that central banks only intervene in the short term now is not a permanent feature of history. They used to intervene up and down the curve at various points. And so operating at the longer end is not a revolution. It's just a return to uh, the way they used to behave. And it's part of the, uh, part of the uh, fact that the zero interest lower bound is a lower bound on one particular asset, but there are lots of other assets you can buy after you've got that one to zero. And you can keep getting more and more into the market and providing more liquidity and reducing other interest rates uh, so that the zero interest lower bound is not the end of expansionary monetary policy at all. The more general question is one that was raised many, many years ago by James Tobin in 1963, which nobody has ever really taken up in a serious way. There's an article of Tobin's called Principles of Debt Management, uh, which uh, those of you who are interested in these historical questions will find in one of his uh, books of collected papers. And Tobin said the most natural asset in which to intervene is the, is, uh, he said capital, by which he meant uh, the stock market. He said that the, the key price is the relative price of capital. By going and buying stocks, you're getting closest to affecting the relative price of capital. And that's what you should do. Now, um, you know, in, uh, when we studied that question, we said, well, you wouldn't know what stocks to buy and all that. Now you can buy indices. And uh, it's not a big deal as figuring out what assets, uh, what particular equities to buy. Uh, 
And that's a question which probably will just stay at the theoretical level uh, for a long time as to where exactly the central bank should be intervening uh, in the spectrum of assets if it's mo trying to run the most efficient uh, monetary policy uh, possible. Um, central banks occasionally intervene in, in uh, equity markets if there's a sort of big collapse, and that's the market maker of lost uh, resort issue. That's uh, lesson number one. I guess the textbooks will look different now than, uh, than they looked uh, before this, uh, this crisis. And certainly in the case of uh, one textbook that I know, uh, we started uh, Dornbush and I in 1978 with about five pages on the liquidity trap. As time went by, the reviewers kept saying this is irrelevant, not of any interest, and it became one and a half pages on the liquidity trap. Then in, uh, in the 1990s, Japan got itself into a mess and has uh, had zero interest rates more or less continuously since then. So then it crept up to two and a half pages. Now I think it'll be back at five or maybe uh, ten because it's uh, a very interesting uh, phenomenon, uh, one which has been going on much longer than we thought it would have to uh, at the beginning. Uh, lesson two. Uh, this is something which we all knew. Critical importance of having a strong and robust financial system. Now, you can say, well, we all knew it. Um, but apparently, uh, we didn't quite know. We didn't know quite how important it is. The um, the simple fact now is, if you look around, there are a bunch of countries that are growing very nicely at the moment, that came out of the recession fairly quickly, and if they have problems, they are dealing with problems of asset prices rising too rapidly, or they're growing too quickly, or they're getting to full employment too quickly. Or not too quickly, they're at full employment. We are one of those countries, Israel. We're not the only such country. Um, uh, the uh, Chinese, who uh, aren't quite an example of how to manage uh, a modern economy, but who successfully manage their economy, came through the recession very quickly and now having to deal with, uh, with inflation. Their banks didn't fail because uh, they didn't let them uh, fail. Australia is doing very well, didn't have a financial crisis. Norway is doing very well, didn't have a financial crisis. Uh, Sweden came close to a financial crisis, didn't have one, and is doing extremely well. And when you Israelis present are told, we are the fastest growing country in the OECD, bad luck, it isn't true. Sweden is the fastest growing country uh, in the uh, OECD, but we're, uh, we're the second fastest. Um, we know from history, and there's this very important book by Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff uh, called This Time is Different, uh, which is the history of 800 years of uh, crises. Uh, crises, uh, macroeconomic crises, and the, the very, very clear re lesson is that a country that has a financial crisis is going to have a much bigger recession that a country, than a country that doesn't have a financial crisis. And uh, so when people say, why did Israel get through this crisis relatively so well, a very important part of the answer is we didn't have any financial institutions that collapsed. Uh, it is not true as everyone says, we got through the crisis easily. We didn't. Uh, there were times the newspapers did their very best to uh, make people nervous uh, by coming and asking questions like, can you promise us that no bank will fail? <laughs> well, that's the sort of thing that you have no answer to because you don't really know what the heck which uh, rogue trader is going to show up tomorrow morning in which bank 
and uh, what's going on. So you have to say things which are true as opposed to things which are reassuring. And uh, so there was some uh, nervousness, and eventually uh, we, uh, the, uh, the prime minister and uh, at the time, and, and I both issued separate statements about uh, no Israeli depositor ever having lo lost money in, uh, in a bank in the 61 years as it was at the time since the state was founded. We didn't actually make any promises, but uh, that was kind of, uh, kind of uh, understood. Um, and we had to put a financial safety net in place for people who lost money in their pension funds and so forth. So there's a lot of work going on in the background to prevent things, people getting too worried. But we did come through it and our banks were strong. Throughout the crisis, the then supervisor of banks um, wouldn't let the banks run down his ca their capital. He kept telling them, you've got too little capital, you get some more. The markets are open. Go mobilize some more uh, money because we don't know how long this is going to go on. The banks were absolutely furious, uh, but we came out of the they came out of the crisis in better shape than they went into it, and uh, it raises an important question about when uh, when you would allow banks to run down reserves if they have excess reserves or uh, when you would change the regulations, and I'll come to that in a while, as to why being one of the devices uh, for dealing with crises uh, in the future. So then the question is what uh, needs to be done to maintain a robust financial system. Uh, there's a huge amount of work going on at present. Out of the Basel Committee, which is the Basel Committee on Bank uh, Supervision, and the Financial Stability Board, which is a board which was set up in the crisis of the 1990s, crises of the 1990s, which uh, are examining a whole range of regulations and uh, suggesting changes in them. The Basel Committee is what was responsible for Basel I and Basel II. Uh, we're now getting uh, the details of Basel III these are issues about how much capital do you need, uh, what sort of capital has been. The bank's basic line is we don't need capital. Uh, and if we do have capital, it shouldn't be capital that uh, is the same as equity. It should be something else, which is less expensive and, and so forth. Um, and so there's a continuing battle. And in fact, the quality of bank capital uh, during this crisis was pretty low. In principle, they had 6 or 7% of Tier 1, that is really good capital, but some of that was subordinated debt and things like that, which wasn't really uh, that available uh, at the time. Uh, the Basel Committee and the Financial Stability Board are examining capital issues. They're examining uh, the incentives that are set up in, uh, in, ba in the banks, uh, uh, for uh, taking risks. This issue of taking risks in the banks, uh, there's a lot of blame for the incentive schemes, but the fundamental cause of uh, risk taking is one that's not going to go away with sort of simple manipulations of uh, incentives because uh, I think that the fundamental uh, incentive that is uh, that operates in the banks is limited liability, and you know all the rest is a uh, sort of builds on that infrastructure. But uh, anybody knows they're going to lose uh, at a maximum the capital they put up. Uh, they can make a lot more than that if their risks uh, turn out if their bets turn out to, to be successful. And I think that's going to be there uh, still in the end, but it doesn't need to have been there in as acute a form as it has been, as it was uh, in this, uh, in this uh, crisis. I'm, I'm not sure that any of the measures that have been put in place, you've got to, if you get an option, you can only exercise it after five years and so forth. I'm not sure how effective they're going to be
but there's a lot of experimentation uh, going on uh, with that. There is a lot of work going on on uh, risk committees, on risk control mechanisms in uh, commercial banks. There is a very lively discussion uh, which went on in the United States as whether it was a good idea to have uh, investment banks and uh, commercial banks operating under the same uh, ceiling uh, under the, uh, and in one institution in which capital could be moved or, or resources could be moved between them. Once you let the investment banks, that is, once you gave up on Glass-Steagall, uh, you gave the investment banks access to uh, a pretty good source of uh, funding, which is deposits, which are relatively cheap, relatively stable, and uh, it's a nice way of uh, funding yourself. And uh, they have a different set of incentives in the investment banks. I, I think I saw this in operation when I was in the uh, commercial sector. Uh, you could say, and people used to say, well, it's just a matter of pricing. They have, the people who use the, the bank's capital have to be charged the right price for it. And you can say that, but to make it work, and actually charging them the right price when these are the sort of these are the these are the money makers of the uh, company, and they come in and tell you I need this that and the other, and then it takes somebody who's pretty strong to tell them uh, bad luck, uh, you're taking a lot of risk, you're going to pay a lot for the capital we're giving you. Uh, I don't think I saw that uh, happen, although one would like to think it could be made uh, to happen. Um, I've included a, a sec what will be the effects of recent recommendations from the Basel Committee and FSB. There is just this huge ambivalence among governments on what they want. Um, the uh, government, you know, you all know this old uh, saying of uh, St. Augustine, something to the effect, oh Lord, make me chaste, but not quite yet. Um, the uh, the uh, governments want the banks to keep lending. They also want the banks to hold more capital. But they don't want that if they're going to hold if they're going to hold more capital and keep lending, they're going to lend less. So the banks sort of the governments sort of want the banks to have more capital, but not quite yet. So they sort of put off the dates for raising the capital. And one of the most ridiculous regulations is that one of the increased capital requirements will go into place in 2019. Well, if you're uh, trying to fix the current system and uh, you're waiting till 2019 to implement a move that you think you should move, you're basically saying it doesn't matter. And uh, I think that's uh, the problem they've got themselves uh, into. And the banks say... Uh, well, you, you know, we, we just can't operate, we can't lend. If you don't show us understandings and if you don't reduce your insistence on have us having very, uh, very good structure of capital, that is equity, not other fancy instruments. Um, so that argument is all going on, and I think it remains to be seen what will be the effects of the uh, recommendations, which are mostly in the right direction, and many of them very good from the Basel Committee and the FSB. I know you had a panel on this at lunchtime, but I haven't read, read the reports yet, and I'm, sure, uh, I'm not sure whether we all agree or all disagree. I put an extra bullet in here under strong and robust financial system, talking about house price increases. Uh, one of the results in, uh, in Reinhardt and Rogoff is that a lot of the financial crises begin in the real estate sector. And uh, you can look around and see that that's true in this crisis. U.S. has a huge, had a huge influence from, uh, from uh, the real estate uh, sector, the U.K. Uh, as well. And uh, other countries that got into trouble had a very strong component of difficulty uh, 
arising uh, from the real estate uh, sector. Uh, there's a lot of incentive to go out and uh, borrow and buy real estate, uh, which is something which, you, which households can leverage on much better than they can on most things. So a lot of the countries, uh, including uh, this one, which cut interest rates dramatically, but whose financial system survived in good shape, are having very rapid increases in housing prices. That's true of us, it's true of Australia, it's true of uh, Norway, uh, and uh, quite a few other countries. And uh, the question then is, what do you do about it? Well, you raise interest rates. But I'll come to the problem that that creates in a little while. So now we move on to uh, lesson three. Uh, the need for macroprudential supervision. Um, what is macroprudential supervision? Well, supervision up to now has been based largely on going to each bank and seeing that it's got enough capital and seeing that it's not lending uh, wildly uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, each bank may look reasonable in, uh, on its own, its capital uh, ratios may be adequate and so forth, but you may be sitting with a banking system uh, which is busily developing, uh, in the process of developing uh, a bubble of some sort, for instance, or uh, developing uh, distortions in the uh, financing of different forms uh, of economic activity. And so we're looking at, um, oh, I see if I talk into my chin, I get a lot of noise. Um, what we're looking at is uh, the supervision of the system as a whole, which means to take a look not only at what's happening in each bank, but to take a look at what's happening in the individual markets uh, which uh, the banks are lending into, and in particular the real estate market, but it's not only the real estate market. There are other markets uh, which get all excited uh, sometimes, and uh, you need to look at those as well. And you can have the illusion that every, uh, every bank is looking healthy without realizing that the system as a whole is heading uh, for uh, trouble. So macroprudential supervision requires the supervisors to look not only at individual banks, but also to look at what's happening uh, to the macro variables, to what's happening, for instance, the rate of expansion of credit uh, overall, to what's happening in individual markets, and to take a view on whether what's going on there is sustainable uh, and whether it's uh, dangerous, and if so, what to, uh, what to do about it. Uh, and this is a problem which, say, we in Israel are facing at the moment. Uh, the individual banks look okay, uh, as far as we can see. The housing market is going great guns, uh, too much. Uh, price, house prices have risen by over 50% in two and a half years, uh, and they continue to rise at about 15 16% a year at the moment is the current rate of increase. Well. These things all look uh, terrific as long as everybody's playing the game. And uh, you buy the house because if you don't buy it now, it'll cost you more later. And that phenomenon is uh, uh, part of a uh, speculative bubble uh, phenomenon where people are expecting to be able to get rid of the uh, asset if there is a problem in time. And uh, you probably all know about the most famous example of bubbles, which is uh, Sir Isaac Newton, who invested in the uh, South Sea Company, um, which was a company which was set up to explore the South Seas and bring the goods from the South Seas back to uh, England to sell them. Nobody knew what the goods were. But that was what it was, and it was an extremely successful company. 
and uh, Newton sold out and made a lot of money. And then the damn thing kept going up and he uh, took another look at it and he bought the second time. That time he didn't get out because the bubble blew, blew up and even Sir Isaac Newton lost, uh, lost money uh, in the South Sea, uh, South sea bubble. Um, so you get into these situations and you say it can't go on, but I'll be out before the other guys. Well, the macro prudential supervision is to look at the whole system and say the system as a whole is behaving in a way that cannot go on, for example. Uh, housing price in Israel can't go on rising at 15 or 20 percent a year. It'll stop uh, at some point. And the question is, uh, how does it stop? And sometimes when bubbles burst, they make a big mess. Uh, so we're dealing with something which is very close to a bubble right now in the housing market. We and the Treasury are changing regulations. Uh, we can't do the obvious thing, which is just raise interest rates till the bubble bursts. Why not? Because we export 45% of GDP, and as we raise the interest rates without taking con just focusing on the housing market, we'll be pricing ourselves out of export markets, and that's not something we particularly want to do. So you're caught in a, in a dilemma and uh, you hope to find other policy uh, tools than just uh, the interest rate. So we've already started uh, imposing uh, restrictions on the banks. You can, for instance, uh, limit the uh, loan-to-value ratio uh, that the banks are permitted to give. Um, in Israel, banks are relatively conservative, that is, relatively to what went on in the States. In the States, you had loan-to-value ratios of well over 100%, because who knows, you might need to buy furniture uh, or something, uh, something like that. And so people got extremely indebted relative to the value of the house, and as soon as the values of the houses started going down, they declared uh, bankruptcy. We have one benefit in the Israeli tax system. It's a benefit for the system. It's not a great benefit for the person who's bound to go broke, uh, which is uh, uh, in the States, the, uh, you can walk away from your house. Your house is separate. And if you've got house financing, you can default on that and not be declared in default on all your other loans. Uh, that's not the case in, uh, in Israel, which means people are more reluctant uh, to default on housing loans in Israel than they are uh, in, uh, in the United States. Well, um, what are the two? So there is this thing called uh, macro prudential supervision, it's supervision of the system as a whole. And then the question is what are the tools for dealing with it? Uh, if you decide that the system is heading for, uh, for a crisis. Well, you can raise interest rates uh, that we're doing. Um, as I said, we can't raise them without worrying about the implications of raising the interest rate for the exchange rate. Uh, and Israel is a major exporter, so we're always engaged in this balancing uh, balancing uh, act. And then the question is, what are the other things? Well, there's loan-to-value ratios. There's a whole lot of terms of housing loans that you can regulate. And there are tax benefits on housing loans, which the Treasury has been taking away. So you can start doing uh, these things, and we've started uh, doing with them, dealing with them. Uh, but we're acting in a rather cautious way because uh, we don't want to overdo it. We know that we've got to stop these prices going up at anything like the existing rate. On the other hand, we don't want to have a collapse of the housing market. So we have to manage this process very delicately and that's what we're trying to do uh, at the moment.
And uh, then there's a question of what are the optimal institutional arrangements for doing this. We, in the central bank, control uh, the terms that bank lenders can pay. In Israel, uh, bank lenders are the main financiers of housing, so our control over the uh, banks, uh, our supervision of the banks, uh, is sufficient for us to have a handle on uh, mortgage terms, on macroprudential uh, supervision. In other countries, you have to go further because there are other sources of, uh, financial, uh, of financing uh, for, uh, for uh, houses. And there's a question there dealing with a potential housing bubble. The answer to dealing with a potential housing bubble is very carefully. Because uh, when they blow up, they can make a spectacular mess. And that's what we're trying to avoid in the gradual way uh, we're dealing with this, uh, with this uh, crisis. Now, a lot of people say, well, when interest rates get back to normal, the problem won't be there. It's very likely that that's true. But it's also true that interest rates have to get back to normal, not only in Israel, where they've gone well over half the route back to normal, but also in the United States and in Britain and in other countries where the interest rate is a half a percent or less because there are consequences to opening up too big a gap with those countries, namely in appreciation, which will have negative impacts on, uh, on the uh, economy. And so we're balancing all the time. What we do in the housing area and what you would do in other areas, high tech was another area in the late uh, 1990s where there was uh, something that looked very much like a bubble uh, at the time and uh, that one ended up rather well. Now, um, I've got a whole host of things I could say but I want to get to the end so I'm not going to... You can come back on any of these issues at the end. Uh, lesson four, dealing with uh, bubbles. And uh, there is the approach which the Fed likes, liked. Um, in uh, 1996, when the uh, Dow Jones index reached 6,400, Alan Greenspan gave a famous speech in, in which he said that uh, Housing prices, the price, housing prices were going up uh, too rapidly. The market was going up uh, too rapidly. And uh, that it wasn't consistent with, he didn't say equilibrium, but it wasn't consistent with the true values of uh, securities. Well, I was, uh, those of you who are older, I, I'm looking at you now, guys. Um, remember Herb Stein, who, with whom I worked on Israel in the 1980s. Uh, Greenspan gave a speech uh, and he said, uh, said the, the, the market is overvalued. So uh, Herb Stein came up, I didn't notice the thing. I wasn't that attuned. But Herb Stein came over to me afterwards and said, did you hear what he said? I said, what did he say? He said, there's a bubble in the uh, stock market and the market's going to go down tomorrow. Well, it certainly did and it actually continued going down for two more days and then boom, went right back up. And uh, I think from that Greenspan decided that he didn't want to talk about it too much uh, anymore. The market got to well over 10,000 uh, and he let it run for a while. He didn't raise interest rates because he believed, and on this he was right, that the rate of productivity growth in the U.S. had turned up. It wasn't in the data, but Greenspan was an absolute master at reading data. And he looked at stock car ladings and all sorts of things that none of you know what they are. And uh, he reached that conclusion. He turned out to, to be right, and he let the boom run. It ran pretty well until 2000. Uh, 
And in the meantime, they formulated an approach, having tried to burst what they thought was a bubble and discovering that it wasn't a bubble, they decided you better wait and let the bubble burst and then clean up the mess. And in the year 2000, the high-tech bubble burst. And they cut interest rates like crazy, and the economy came back very quickly. Uh, so it looked like the, uh, the mopping up approach, as it was called, was successful. Uh, and uh, then we get uh, the basic questions. Should the central bank react to asset prices? I believe the answer is uh, yes, but the Fed, after the failure of what it said in, uh, in 1996, of Greenspan's speech in 1996, decided it shouldn't react to asset prices. It should just wait for asset prices to blow up, if they were going to blow up. Um, I don't know, the uh, stock market is an important part of the uh, transmission process of uh, between real activity and the financial markets. So I'm not clear on what theoretical base that argument uh, was built, that you shouldn't intervene. Uh, uh, if you think there's a stock market uh, boom going on. Uh, and then the question is, how did intelligent people ever uh, come up with a view that you shouldn't do it? They came up with it in the, via the following argument. If we were to want to stop this, we'd have to raise interest rates so high that we'd create a recession, uh, a big recession, if, uh, if we had wanted to go in at uh, 11,000 or something like that. Uh, and creating a, a, a big stock market decline is not something we want to do. We'll leave it to the markets to do, and we'll come in and clean up the mess. And as I say, that worked in 2000. 2001, when they raised, reduced interest rates rapidly and uh, after the uh, collapse, uh, that was the collapse of the high-tech bubble, which Israelis know about, uh, and uh, the, the economy came back very well. Now, this approach of cleaning up after the event is known as the mopping up approach. And the question is, is, is it ever optimal? Well, it seemed to be okay in uh, 2001, 2000, 2001. Um, but I think the argument is kind of misplaced uh, in the sense that the question is always put, if you think you see a bubble, should you try to burst it? Uh, I think the question you should put is, if you see asset prices rising very rapidly, should that be another factor that enters your decision on the interest rate? I think if you put it in the second form of instead of should you try to blow it up, which is an extreme thing, should you pay attention to asset prices in, de, in uh, fixing your uh, monetary policy interest rate, it doesn't sound like such an extreme thing to do because asset prices are the transmission mechanism between uh, what's going on today and what's expected to happen tomorrow. Uh, so I imagine the mopping up approach could be... Uh, could be okay in some cases if you're dealing with something that's not as fundamental to the economy and not as big in the economy as the housing market is. But I don't like it, and I would rather take action beforehand uh, to try and deal with whatever problems uh, you have in the asset markets. So now we come to uh, lesson five. Uh, the lender of last resort and the problem of too big to fail. This crisis was beset with problems of institutions which are too big to fail and uh, which got saved by uh, central banks or other uh, authorities. Now, you um, see a bank getting into severe trouble and uh, you never know. There's this distinction which central bankers make between liquidity and solvency. It's in, uh, it's in Badgett. It's a very old distinction. Uh, the, uh, the rule for central bankers is you, should, you, should, you, could lend, you can lend to a bank that is having liquidity problems. That means that it's fundamentally solvent, 
Uh, but you have to make a, a, an institution that is fundamentally insolvent, you have to restructure it and so make it become insolvent. That's the way the theory was always put. Uh, and people say it's in Badgett. It's not quite in Badgett, but it's almost uh, in, uh, in Badgett, which is a wonderful book uh, to read if you want to see what financial journalists wrote like. 150 years ago, they were pretty good. Um, the, uh, the problem of uh, liquidity and solvency is you don't know. A, uh, an institution shows up and needs loans. And in the beginning, everybody says, oh, it's short of liquidity. Then you're all inclined to give it a nice big loan and say, here you are, nice boy, just sell off those assets and uh, we'll give you a temporary loan and then you'll have the money that you need and so forth. So that's the view that it's just suffering from a liquidity problem. The banks have assets which have longer maturities than their uh, liabilities, so uh, they have to sometimes get a loan in order to have time to sell off their assets. But as crises, but you don't really know, and as crises develop, what look like liquidity problems become solvency problems. Uh, and if you're not looking at the system as a whole, you may think, well, this bank's in trouble and uh, it's just a liquidity issue. And then you turn around you discover that a lot of banks are in trouble. And uh, then it doesn't look just like a liquidity issue. It looks like you're heading for big trouble. And you have to decide uh, how many to save, how many not, not to save. Now, you can uh, inject a lot of uh, liquidity into a bank and keep it operating uh, for a while. And uh, that's what central banks tend to do. They are aware of the moral uh, hazard in this uh, approach. Namely, if you always save every bank, uh, they tend to take too many risks. So they're always tempted to make an example of somebody, just to show you can't rely on them to save everybody. So I don't know what the Fed was doing when it decided to let Lehman Brothers fail. Uh, the Fed said that it was legally, it had, legally it had no way of saving Lehman Brothers. And so it wasn't an issue of a decision. There was just nothing that could be done and it had to go bankrupt because uh, it didn't fit the rules. I think it is true from uh, what I remember of uh, the economic history of the 19th century that three times in the 19th century they had a gold standard in Britain which meant you couldn't, the central bank couldn't create more liquidity, couldn't, uh, couldn't create more money than it had gold. That was the, that was the law. Um, three times in the 19th century the, bank, the governor of the Bank of England broke that law uh, because there was a liquidity crisis growing on everybody wanted Bank of England money Bank of England didn't have gold and then they had to decide do they tell all these guys sorry or uh, they wanted Bank of England paper we make Bank of England paper here yeah, take some um, and uh, three times they broke, the governor of the Bank of England broke the law. Uh, I've mentioned this uh, precedent to people who were running the Fed at the time. I'm not sure they were enthralled uh, by the fact that the... Uh, well, what happened to these guys who broke the law? They got, uh, they got a retroactive... The parliament passed a retroactive law in each case afterwards and said and made kosher the breaking uh, of the law. I'm not sure that would have happened in the United States if, uh, if the Fed had broken the law, if it was indeed, would indeed have been a breaking of the law to save uh, Lehman Brothers. But after Lehman Brothers uh, went broke, the Fed wasn't going to do it again. And uh, so then, a week later, they saved uh, AI, a few days later, they saved AIG, which was not even a bank. Uh, and uh, they didn't let any major companies fail uh, after, after that. Now, 
Um, the uh, problem of too big to fail is a very big, uh, is a very serious problem. And allowing banks to go around thinking they'll be saved without any major consequences for anybody is not a good, uh, good incentive to good behavior. So the central bankers have been searching very hard for a way of uh, getting, of dealing with this problem of banks which should fail from the viewpoint of uh, what they've done in the past and from the viewpoint of the current state of their balance sheet uh, and uh, from the, uh, uh, but from the viewpoint of the regulator, it's too risky uh, to make them fail because you could get a panic on the scale that you got for Lehman Brothers. Now, you know, uh, we all like strong leaders uh, and um, so I've been dealing with this problem that people say, you've got to make the bank fail if it's really broke. But you do that and you cause enormous damage to the system, typically. So I, I thought about it for a long time. I've come up with a, a simple rule. If you are going to make a bank fail to teach its 100 uh, manager, senior managers and its 50,000 shareholders or whatever, and you're going to cause a major recession that will affect 40 million people, you're too late. Forget about being a hero and uh, worrying about moral hazard. Just save the damn thing because, uh, and get the thing right next time. Because there's no calculus I can see which says, well, um, we saved, uh, uh, we saved the banks in, in, uh, in France, we saved the banks in Thailand, let's say. But we've got to make an example of someone, so congratulations, you 40 million Koreans, you're it. And uh, the global system will make an example of you. And I cannot figure out the justification for doing that, and I just think uh, you should have done something earlier, and you better accept by that stage that you've lost that in that particular round of the moral hazard uh, game. And uh, so I believe that uh, if you get to that point, it's just too late. You should have dealt with this problem earlier. It means bank supervisors have to be a lot quicker to uh, pick up problems than they have been in the past. Uh, and at least at this stage, they're behaving that, uh, that way. Now, um, the, uh, it says there are fiscal consequences. Uh, if banks are broken, you have to inject money into them. Uh, the central bank loses money. But central banks uh, in Israel, the central bank is not allowed to intervene without the Treasury's permission if it thinks the institution is bankrupt. We can save a bank that we are willing to say is solvent. Where the law prevents us extending loans to a company that we think is insolvent. And then you have to get the Treasury's uh, permission uh, to do that. Uh, and in the end, all these actions are fiscal. I mean, it, all these actions, if the, if the bank goes broke, and if the public sector has to put in money, why? because the profits of the central bank are transferred to the treasury in almost every country. There are a few countries where the, central, where the arrangements are different. So if you go in and save a bank uh, which is broke and you're going to lose a lot of money thereafter, uh, the treasury is going to get less money for the next 20, 30 years. They're paying. Uh, they're paying for this uh, bank... Uh, bank uh, rescue, and there are fiscal uh, consequences um, uh, because the flow of profits that they will get from the central bank is less than it would have been had the banks uh, been solvent. So that's one of the consequences, and you have to just work out arrangements with the uh, central bank. Israel, I think, has a pretty good law uh, 
in the sense that uh, if you think there are going to be fiscal consequences, that it's not purely a liquidity problem, you have to get the agreement of the Treasury uh, to do what you propose uh, doing. Uh, it's a very old law, and it's kind of uh, advanced for its age. Um, then you get to this too-big-to-fail issue. And uh, one of the reasons the Fed may have let Lehman Brothers fail is that Lehman Brothers was, is a moderate... By the U.S. standards, Lehman Brothers was not a big bank. It was a modest-sized uh, bank. I think its capital was about $600 billion, which is not massive uh, by the standards of the United States, and they probably thought they could let it go. But, as you'll see on that slide, there's the word interconnected there. It turned out that Lehman Brothers had connections with the whole system, and once Lehman went a whole set of other transactions immediately uh, became problematic and uh, a lot of other banks uh, started getting into severe trouble, partly as a result of the panic because uh, people hadn't expected this to happen, partly as a result of the fact that Lehman was very interconnected in the system. SIFIs are systemically important financial institutions. They are very big banks and in all the work trying to revise banking regulations and the banking sector going on, the SIFI problem hasn't been resolved. What do you do with a bank that has branches in 100 countries uh, or subsidiaries in 100 countries? And if you cause it to fail, a big one, uh, you're going to create a mess around the world. Are you supposed to save it? Or are you supposed to allow it to, to uh, collapse? Uh, what are you supposed to, to do? And then the, uh, the question uh, arises, uh, what do you do with one of those banks? And generally, in the end, the central bank saves it. Now, what we don't have, there's actually nothing wrong with saving it, provided you don't save it and keep the shareholders whole. Because the uh, people who put up the money are the people who should lose. Uh, and in general, the, the central banks have found a way of dealing with uh, the shareholders. They generally lose almost all their money in one of these cases. But nobody's resolved the problem of what to do with the bondholders of the banks. And uh, the, the big fear has been that if you don't keep the bonds whole, you're going to... Hey, the problem in this whole thing is, is one of runs. If the moment a bank gets into trouble, everybody knows that you're going to dispossess the bondholders and you're going to dispossess uh, the shareholders, uh, they start running immediately. The share price will collapse, the, the uh, depositors will collapse, and you get into a run, and then it's too late to, to do something. You either have to save it or, uh, or face a big problem, and then the central, the central banks tend to save those institutions. And I think when you've got to that position, that's probably, unless it's a small bank, it's probably the only thing you can do. Well, that creates a moral hazard uh, because the banks know they can misbehave, and they do. And that's why one of the arguments that's been going on strongly now is an argument uh, which uh, Paul Volcker makes, which is the United States which revoked... Uh, the Glass-Steagall Act, which said that commercial banks could not be associated with investment banks. Uh, that rule was changed in 1999, uh, and they can be associated. I mean, Citigroup, uh, all of the big banks have investment banks, and they're using the same capital. And so it means that deposits are, your deposits and mine, are financing the activities of investment banks, some of which are quite risky. And so you spread this risk into the whole system. And Volcker, for instance, keeps arguing we've just got to undo uh, the, uh, the revocation of the Gloss-Steagall uh, Act and uh, return to the situation that we had, the United States had, up to... Uh, 1998, which is you're a commercial bank or you're an investment bank. 
and uh, the public's deposits are with commercial banks, which are regulated and don't take big risks. Um, so uh, that's it. So now the question that is still on the uh, agenda is, do we have a solution to the problem of banks being too big to fail? Uh, for the very big ones, we don't. What you need is a way of taking over the bank, running it down, that is putting it into an insolvency proceedings and just running it down. Uh, and if it was the only bank in that situation, you might be able to do it. But if your having done it affects what the st stability of other banks, which is what it does, because people don't want to be in that situation where their money is stuck in a bank and they have to get out and click go into legal proceedings to claim their money back. They don't want to be there, and uh, so it's the contagion for making one bank fail uh, that is uh, the problem. Will we have one? People are working on solutions. Uh, my guess is we will have one. Um, then the next question is, will anyone be brave enough to try it? And uh, those are not easy decisions because you can make a real mess if you make the wrong decision. If you make one of the world's big banks fail, and it sets off a series of runs on banks around the world, you've done something you really didn't want to do. And uh, that's why uh, I believe that the whole moral hazard argument should be fundamentally an argument about how do you set up these institutions how do you deal with them when you can still deal with them when they're looking good? What do you have to do to raise their capitals, uh, the amount of capital they hold, make them take less risks, and so forth? Once you've got to the situation where it's put in a lot of money to save them or cause them to fail on the brink of a, global, of a crisis, a big crisis, don't be a hero. Don't announce, <coughs> I am not going to put money into the these banks. I'm going to insist on their meeting strong commercial standards. Well, you can do that. Uh, it's very heroic. It's probably stupid. Um, but uh, I'm not, this is a view which uh, is not widely, sh is not shared by all my colleagues. Um, I don't talk about the Bank of Israel. I'm talking about other central bank governors. Um, well, I'll just put this on the board so you can see it. Uh, I'd like to have some discussions. I'm going to hurry along. This is about the importance of the exchange rate for small uh, open economies like, uh, like ours. Um, the choice of the exchange rate system matters. And then there are big discussions about what you do when the exchange rate starts moving. Do you intervene or don't you intervene? Uh, it's fashionable to say you shouldn't intervene, uh, and it's fashionable to say you can't intervene because you don't have enough resources. That statement is half true. It's half true when you're depreciating. You don't have enough resources to stop. You don't have enough dollars to stop the currency depreciating uh, because what do people want? They want a foreign currency. Well, you've got reserves, but you can't make the foreign currency. When the money is pouring into your country, as it is now, you can actually uh, intervene and keep intervening. Uh, and they want what you can make, money, the national money, shekels. We're good at making that. We're not good at making dollars. So if people want to buy shekels, we can supply them. Uh, and then the question is, what are the consequences? Well, you're increasing liquidity, but you you get rid of that uh, by selling uh, other assets to take liquidity out of the system. So essentially, you uh, go in, you buy uh, the foreign exchange that's coming in, and then you sell domestic bonds, so you just change the composition of the portfolio uh, of the public. And then there's a question of how long can you keep doing that, because you keep getting more and more dollars, as we are getting more and more dollars in Israel. Our reserves are very high. Uh, now by international standards. Well, I don't want to go on uh, with all that, uh, but I just uh, mention it. It's an issue that has come up and that is now
central in what's going on in the international system. Every country that had a good crisis, that didn't have bank failures on a large scale, uh, is growing and growing quite rapidly. And it's not true only of China and only of India. It's true of Western economies. Ours is growing rapidly. Norway is growing rapidly. Um, and Australia is growing rapidly, though it's, of course, closer to uh, China, and that may be part of the reason. If you didn't have a, your, if your banking system didn't collapse, you're doing pretty well at the moment if you know how to run policy. If your banking system did collapse, you're like the United States, you're like Europe. You're barely growing at the moment. And the difference is, is the banking system alive? Um, lesson seven, the eternal verities, lessons from the IMF. It turns out that if you manage your budget well, and if you keep the inflation rate relatively low, and you do all the boring things that the IMF tells you to do and that your parents would tell you to do if you were a central banker, uh, <laughs> it works. And uh, those are the countries that came through the crisis very well. Ones that had small budget deficits, uh, low inflation rates, uh, and uh, banks in uh, good health, and a whole series uh, of other things. Those are the ones that came through well. And that's what the IMF uh, tells you. It's, it's sort of disappointing that these old-fashioned stories are true. You would prefer to be in a situation where you can do things uh, that uh, are daring and brave and what have you and innovative. <coughs> Uh, but the innovations uh, sometimes don't work, and you need to keep the, base, the basics of the uh, situation together. If the basics of the situation are together, then you can do innovative things on the basis of having a decent fiscal situation, a strong banking system, and so forth. Now, I've only actually got one more lesson, and then we'll go on to uh, the rest. Uh, what is the best uh, monetary policy? It is uh, what is called flexible inflation targeting. What does flexible inflation targeting mean? Well, the typical objectives of a modern central bank are those that are set out there. They are, and there's primacy given to this, to maintain price stability, typically defined as we define it as inflation around 2%, with some room for variations. Support for the other goals of government policy, and this is particularly employment, uh, and growth, um, subject to, and the dot, 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 is subject to, if there's a conflict, price stability takes precedence. And then uh, you should support financial stability. Those are the objectives of a modern central bank. That's flexible inflation targeting. And then the question is, what do you get from this? Um, it is striking for those of you who do monetary policy that if you read the objective functions, that uh, used to be used in the 1970s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the objective function of central banks. They had the growth, or the level of employment, and the uh, inflation rate in there. Now, if you read the uh, objective functions that are used by exponents of inflation targeting, they are the same. And then the question is, uh, what is it that's different about inflation targeting? And it's that there's a pi minus pi star, and the pi star is supposed to be taken seriously. And it is. And there are institutional arrangements for doing that uh, in inflation targeting frameworks, as you have to explain why you don't meet the inflation uh, target. The weakness of the old approach used to be that at the margin, it never looks like a good idea to give up half a percent of GDP or one percent of GDP growth in order to get the inflation rate down by one percent. And you make that argument at three percent inflation, and you can make it at four percent, and pretty soon you're making it at six percent, at which point you're very unhappy. 
And so this system works. It is not very different from what went before, but the difference is essential. And that is that you cannot escape the inflation target if you're in an inflation targeting regime. It's flexible because it doesn't say you have to be there at every moment of time. Uh, and uh, so you have, a, you have some time to get back to target if you're driven away from it. And that system seems to have worked pretty well and it's working pretty well now. And the flexibility relates to the speed with which you try to come back to the target. But there is a long-term inflation target, and if you look at the countries which target inflation, seven or eight years out, the expected inflation rate is around the target. In the case of Israel, too. People expect inflation eight years from now to be about 2.5%, and there's some adjustment, uh, risk adjustment in that number. So it's probably they expect it to be around 2%, which is where we are. And that's what you, I mean, that's our target. That's what you can derive from the capital markets. And I think that is the best way of doing monetary policy. It's called flexible inflation targeting. Flexibility relates to your ability to depart from the target for some time if you find yourself in a, if you've driven away from the target or if you find yourself in a situation where uh, for the short run, it's optimal to move away from the target as long as you understand you're going to get back there. And the typical horizon is two years. In Israel, we've typically looked at something less than two years because our inflation is very uh, volatile. And I'm not sure I have much, much knowledge of what's going to happen two years from now. So try to get back within a year, a year and a half. Now, the last two lessons are lessons of experience. I think they're not economics. They're probably uh, life lessons. Uh, Um, my first crisis was uh, in 1994. I joined the, my first crisis in which I had responsibility. Uh, I joined the IMF in September 1994 and the uh, star poster child of the IMF was Mexico. It was doing all these wonderful things. Um, then I had to have some little operation so I chose the 20th of December because I knew nothing would happen over Christmas to have this little operation and I'm sitting at home the next day when somebody calls at 11 at night and says uh, Mexico is going to devalue tomorrow. They had a fixed rate or a flow, uh, adjustable rate. My wife says, what are you swearing about? So uh, this happens. And... Uh, then they showed up, and I was, I was very upset because I thought Mexico had finally cracked the code. They'd figured out how to grow, and everything was wonderful. And here was our poster child just uh, suddenly turned into uh, a failure. That was very hard to take. Uh, anyway, they showed up the next day, and uh, they had a very good team. And by six months later, they were back. Uh, they were back uh, on track, and they certainly didn't panic, maybe because they'd seen a lot of crises. Now, I, uh, this being my first crisis, which I felt direct responsibility for because it was Christmas, and the managing director was away and I was in charge, uh, I was kind of very upset and nervous and all that. And then the managing director came back, my boss, the number one in the IMF, came back, I was the number two, he was as calm, as uh, cool as a cucumber. And I couldn't figure out. I mean, here the world was ending, at least the world as I thought, with Mexico being perfect and all that. And he seemed totally unfazed. Uh, and his first uh, words, we had to meet at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, the day after he got back, and he said, gentlemen, and we were all gentlemen, I'm afraid to say, uh, he said, gentlemen, this is a crisis, and in a crisis you don't panic. And then we got down to business. And uh, he didn't panic, and then I realized the reason you don't panic is because crises end. This is something I hadn't quite 
internalized at that stage. I thought we were going into a new world. Um, anyway, Mexico sort of came out pretty well, very well, because they had a very good team. Uh, and uh, they knew what to do, and they did it, and they got themselves back into good shape. But the do not panic is critical. You just have to sit there and figure things out. And the people who sort of run around panicking and thinking the world owes them a living uh, and so forth are very dangerous to have around uh, when you're in a crisis. That's a story about life. It's not only a story about uh, financial crises. And I left... Um, uh, lesson uh, 10 uh, blank. So on, on, uh, on uh, lesson 9, that one, in a crisis uh, you do not panic, and the answer how to avoid panicking is just sit down and look at the numbers and get on and ask what it is you have to do. And people will tell you it's impossible, can't be done, etc., etc. And then sort of a week later they realize they've got to do something and so they get on uh, and do it and it's tough and then you can say look guys um, the sooner uh, you do this uh, the better it's going to be and you're just going to have to get on with it and the ones who are good uh, not good economists they, they typically are good economists but the ones who are good policy makers are the ones who get down to business and do it. Because the approach uh, which we see being adopted now in some countries, which is you should really spread this damage out over three or four or five years, it's not the best approach by far. Because by year three, everybody is totally fed up. And they already want to start growing and they want uh, all sorts of... Uh, all sorts of uh, things uh, uh, to happen. Uh, and uh, they don't, if you don't do them quickly. Because the public cannot put up with five years of continuing squeezing. And we'll cut a little bit this year, and we'll cut a little bit more next year, and we'll cut a little bit more next year. The public doesn't go along with that. If you're going to do it, do it. And uh, that's what Israel did in, uh, in, on July the 1st, uh, 1985. It cut the budget deficit by 8% on one day. Fortunately, I say fortunately in quotation marks, there were uh, a lot of subsidies around, so you could cut the budget deficit by 8% uh, in one day. Uh, but get on and put yourself in a situation from which uh, you will uh, emerge. And then uh, my lesson 10 uh, which is one I've learnt from dealing with many crises is uh, the following. Never say never. Uh, because you're going to say I wouldn't under any circumstances impose this measure or that measure or the other measure. And then you get to the point where you look around, something's going to blow up unless you do something, and guess what? What you have to do is one of the things you said you'd never do. So never say never. Thank you very much.